Heavenly Father, we praise you and we worship you. We thank you so very much for your word, for your spirit. We thank you most of all for the blood of the covenant and the gift of repentance so that we can be made right and stand before you, Father. Help us, Father, to live out the ways that you have set before us. Be our strength. In our weakness, you remain strong. And we thank you so very much for your loving kindness, your tender mercy. And we ask that you would lead us and guide us tonight as we study your word, Father. I pray that you would anoint my mind and my lips. Forgive me of any sin I may have committed against your covenant. As I begin to delve into your word, Father, bring to remembrance all things you wish for me to speak, and let every word spoken be for the purpose of edifying your people and your kingdom. In the mighty name of Yahshua we pray, hallelujah, and amen. Conceptions of modern Hebrew. And when I say that, I'm not saying that um, you know all Hebrew teachers have it completely wrong, but what I am saying is, is that it has been uh, used in ways that it would not have been used uh, anciently in the modern Hebrew. It is one of the most underlined letters, in my humble opinion, in the whole ancient Hebrew alphabet. And what I mean by that is when we look at the picture of this letter, it is the symbol of what fastens or secures us in our faith. So that's a big one. I mean, all of the letters have very deep meaning and bring us to very great understandings. But when we look at this letter here in its history, and the de-evolution of its pronunciation, by the way, I'm going to be pointing, pointing out some things here. Uh, uh, normally, someone who wants to use a three-syllable pronunciation for the Father's name will dive right to this letter and say that it's always been pronounced as a U. Now, that's very problematic. Because if you take the word hova, that's a wa. The the. Okay, so they're saying that the U pronunciation is superior over the the. And so if that stands true, then hova, that means ruin, would be hua. Now we have an issue. Because Hova in modern Hebrew means ruin and destruction. So if you're saying Yahuwah, then you're saying Yah destroys. 
Yah is a destroyer. But we know that Yah is redemption. Yah is life. Yah is salvation. Yah Shua. And the Yahoo pronunciation, as we've proven in other studies, Yahoo comes from an Aramaic background, not an ancient form of Hebrew. For instance, many of us read in the scriptures Yahuda. Yahuda, and that's the tribe of Judah. But the root word of Judah is Yada. Anciently, it would have been called Yada. So the Aramaic influence over the years has changed uh, almost every pronunciation that you see in your Strong's Concordance. As a matter of fact, if you look up Isaiah, it's going to give you a Hebrew number, and you go look at that Hebrew number, and it first says, Yaseya, and then it says, or Yaseyahu. Right, so the, the Yahoo stuff is a secondary pronunciation, and what I propose is that it came in through the vowel point system and the Aramaic form of the Hebrew letters. Well, actually, they're not Hebrew letters at all. Modern Hebrew is all Aramaic letters. Hence the influence. And it was happening in the first century. How do we know that? We have documented evidence that says that they were in Judea as well, in, especially in the temple in the first century. They did not allow the services to be conducted in any other language of Hebrew. If you went into a synagogue in or around the land of Judea, which Judea in itself. Okay, and now remember, all of this stems behind this wall, this peg. Okay? And the question sent in is, is uh, also asking about uh, Yesaya chapter 22. We're going to go check that out after we go through this. Because this is a very, again, a very important letter. <clears throat> so, knowing that there is secondary pronunciations, we know that there was an original pronunciation. My whole argument. Now, it's my, and I'm going to say this is my opinion through my research of the language anciently, is many times the wa would have been silent. Just as the aleph in modern Hebrew many times is silent. Because of the function of the letter wa, which is to connect things. Okay? Some people say Yahushua. That's because it's Yod, He, Wa, Shin, I. Okay? So they're saying Yahu. But I submit to you that they took the short form of the Tetragrammaton, Yah, and they connected it to a form of Sha, Yasha. So you've already got the Yah in there, so the, the, the form of the other word, Yasha, changes when you connect it with the Wa. The Wa is a connecting letter. So it would have been connecting two different words and therefore would have been silent. But now we pronounce it. Okay, so... Is it correct to say the way that we as clay vessels are secured into the house of Elohim is by being secured by the peg? Now do we remember? <laughs> okay, and um, they quote uh, Yesaiah chapter 22, verses 22 through 24, so let's go ahead and read that. Uh, 
That's um, Isaiah chapter 22. So again, to grab the context, we'll begin at uh, verse 20 and we'll read to the end of the chapter there. Isaiah chapter 22, beginning at verse 20. And it shall be in that day that I shall call my servant uh, Eliakim, son of Helikiah, and I shall put your robe on him. <laughs> Hallelujah. And strengthen him with your girdle. And give your authority into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of the Yada or Yehuda. And I shall place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. And he shall open, and no one shuts. Here's, here's the answer right here. Okay? And he shall open, and no man shuts, and shall shut, and no man opens. And I shall fasten him like a peg in a steadfast place. And he shall become a throne of esteem to his father's house. And they shall hang him, hang on him all the way to his father's house, the offspring of the offshoots and the offshoots, all vessels of small quantity, from the cups to all of the jars. In that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, the peg that is fastened in the steadfast place shall be removed and cut down and fall, and the burden that was on it shall be cut off. For Yahweh has spoken. Now, what I would like to point out <clears throat> is that this peg is removing something that already existed. And I would submit to you that what we're seeing here is a bit of a prophecy concerning a false messiah. There's, there's something that was there that is being removed by something that would be fastened and secured. Alright, let's look at that again. It speaks in verse 21, And I shall put your robe on him and strengthen him with your girdle. Now, remember, um, these are priestly concepts. Prophet and priestly concepts that we're seeing here. Robes, girdles, and everything else. Okay? Uh, uh, and I will give him, I will strengthen him with your girdle and give your authority into his hand. Okay? How do we know what I just said can be validated? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Now we've went, we've covered this a few different times in the past, but how many times have we been told by the church that this garment or these uh, uh, this armor was that of a soldier? That in Ephesians chapter six we're seeing the armor of a soldier. I submit to you that from a Hebrew perspective, they would have never given the Roman soldier's credit here. Okay? And what we're reading about is priestly garments. That is our armor. Remember in the prophecy we just read, it's talking about the girdle. Beginning at verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 6. For the rest of my brothers, be strong in the master and in the mightiness of his strength. 
put on the complete armor of Elohim. For you to have power to stand against the schemes of the devil. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers and of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in, heaven, in the heavens. Because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim. See, this is not, it's not the armor of a soldier. It's the armor that was given to us by the Father. That you have power to withstand in the, in the wicked day, and having done all, to stand. Stand then having girded your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. See, that is talking about girding yourself with this armor. And I submit to you once again that this is a priestly garment, not the garment of a soldier. Stand then, having girded your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So there's the breastplate that was worn by the high priest. Verse 15, And having fitted your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace, above all, having taken up the shield of belief with which you have the power to quench all of the burning arrows of the wicked one. Take also the helmet of salvation, the helmet of deliverance. Okay, remember what was on the headdress of the high priest. Kodesh unto Yahweh is what was on that headdress. So, every time one of the other priests looked at that high priest, he saw it coming of Yahweh. As a what? High priest. <laughs> they were looking at the high priest who was wearing all of the armor of Elohim and they had girded their self. All of those years it was a picture of Yahweh coming as a priest, as the lamb, as the king to redeem his people. Notice that the headdress did not say holy unto Yahweh's redemption. Let me point out what I mean by that. We know that Yahshua was a high priest. We know that. We also know that Yahweh was the first one to sacrifice. He was the first high priest. That makes him Kohen Hagadol, the high priest over all. When Yahshua came into the world, some men showed up in front of the governors of that age and said, hey, we've come to worship the king. Right? We've come to worship the king. And he's like, well, that's me. And he said, when you find him, Come back and let me know. I want to. I want to worship him too. Yeah. Which was a lie, <laughs> right? So we know by the word that he was a king. There's only one king over Israel. There is only one king over Israel. So then, Yahshua, who has been declared king comes into the picture to get baptized by Yohanan the Immerser or John the Baptist. And what did John the Baptist say when he seen him coming? Behold the Lamb of Elohim. So this is showing us that we have scripture that says he was the king and the Lamb. He was both king and the Lamb. And he said, 
I need you to immerse me, Yohanan. And he said, I need you to immerse me. And he said, forbid it not. For thus it needs to be so to fulfill all righteousness. What's the Hebrew word for righteousness? Zadikah. You see, he wasn't immersing himself because he had sinned. He was immersing himself because he was a king that was about to be present the sacrifice as a high priest before the throne of Elohim. And in the Torah, it says specifically that the high priest must wash his garments before he goes into the Holy of Holies. Making sense? He did not get baptized for any sin that he had committed. He was sinless. And he was also selfless. So we also see in 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of righteousness. Yahweh was manifested in the flesh. The king of Israel was manifested in the flesh to present a sacrifice to himself and raise up that sacrifice for himself. And he was the high priest that would present it before the throne, before the ark of the true ark of the covenant. I mean the one in the heavens, which everything we have here on the earth is a shadow of that. Okay? So, everything that we read about in, in, in this passage, he's saying Elohim gave the children of Israel an armor. And there's only one, let's pick up at verse 17 again. Take also the helmet of deliverance and the what sword of the Spirit, which is the word of Elohim. Pray at all times with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit watching in all perseverance and supplication for all the set-apart ones. You see that? For all the set-apart ones, this armor is the picture of the high priest and the only offensive tool that he has given us in all of this armor is the sword, the word of Elohim. All of the rest of them are defensive tools that he has provided in his pattern and in his plan. This is not the armor of a fleshly soldier, but the armor that Elohim gave us to protect ourselves from the enemy with. It's a priesthood. And that priesthood, verse uh, 18 again, praying at all times with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching in all perseverance and supplication for all those that are being set apart. Did He not tell Moses, go down and set the people apart because in three days I'm coming. Had they not just been uh, all grafted into a priesthood in Exodus chapter 19? The whole book is about the armor of Elohim and it comes by blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So this peg is our security. Okay? Going back to the Isaiah passage. And the whole topic here is uh, Shabina being banished is the whole context of this passage. Okay, so something is being removed and then a peg is being put in its place. Verse 23 again, And I shall fasten him like a peg in a steadfast place, and he shall become a throne of esteem to his father's house, and they shall hang on him all the weight of his father's house, the offspring and the offshoots, all vessels of small quantity,
from the cups to all of the jars. In that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, the peg that is fastened. <laughs> That's number 8628. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, it's the Hebrew word taka. Taka. The peg that is fastened in the steadfast place shall be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was on it shall be cut off. So here we see something that was there being removed and Yahweh permanently fastening something in its steed. So we look at this word fastened. It's 8628 in the Hebrew. It's a Hebrew word takah. 8628 in your strongs. Six twenty-eight in the Strong's Taka. It's a primary or primitive root to clatter, slap the hands together, clang an instrument by analogy to drive a nail or tin pin a dart to become bondsman by hand clasping. Do you see what this was saying in the Hebrew? He was saying that he was going to remove something and then he was going to go, hey, see how I just got your attention? He's going to take our attention off something that was and put our attention on something that will be. He got their attention by, hey, clapping the hands. That Hebrew is a very action-oriented language. And so he got their attention and he took, removed something. How many of us in the room have had something that we worshiped and prayed to for years? And now we have, he's got our attention and we see what he actually and who he actually fastened. Now, we have our Hebrew number. What's our next move? So, to answer your question, sister, yes. Absolutely, this passage is speaking or alluding to something in the future, meaning Yahshua being fastened as a peg. What his job is to hold down the, the tent, and that's what the wall is a picture of a tent peg. Great question! <laughs> Hallelujah! So now we have our Hebrew number. 8628. I'll pull that up. On the screen. I have to look up the It's number 2902V. Help me remember that, everyone. 2902V. on page 470.
There it is. Okay. Look at this. Look at the ancient meaning of that. There you see taka, ta, kuf. Let me move that down so I can. Taka. Ta, kuf, ayin. So there's a picture of two cross sticks, which means covenant. Uh, then we have the kuf, which, or a sign, sign, covenant, mark. Then you have uh, the kuf, which is a picture of the sun on the horizon, meaning a day dawning or a day beginning, ending, uh, a time period of time. And then we have the eye, which is, of course, the picture of an eye. And it means uh, to see or gain knowledge of something. So this word taka that has been translated as fasten or fasten, it has to do with a mark in time and having the knowledge of that mark in time. Specifically, it says, in that day. <laughs> so those who have been marked with the sign of the covenant in the body of Yahshua, we now have received that fastening. But how many people are there out there that haven't been fastened according to this prophecy yet? Quite a few. But we're trying to fish them in. And get them marked. What's going to be? What's the two main marks to show that you are a vessel? Remember, it's got to do with a vessel. That you are a vessel of Yahweh. What are the two of the main marks? Sabbath, Sabbath and the name. The name is a mark, and the Sabbath is a sign in a signet that you are His people. Once again, always keep this, when Yahweh revealed this part to me, it was moving. The bride will always be identified by the name of the husband. Don't ever forget that. If you are engaged to someone, you're fixing to lose something that has been attached to you if you're a female. You're about the bride, the bride-to-be, is about to lose something she's had all of her life. We have a father of this world. Prayerfully, not all of our fathers were of the world. Mine was. Had I had a sister and she was betrothed to marry a man, the last name Wilson, that was given to her by my father of the world. She would have lost that whenever she married this man. She would have took on his name. See the point? The bride will always be identified by the name of the husband. It is a mark. How do we know that? Look at the word Shem. Name. It's a mark. And we have scriptural testimony to that everywhere. In the book of Revelation. He's going to mark those. And his name will be on our foreheads. It doesn't mean that we're going to have a big tattoo. yod hey wah -he. uh, There's so many false doctrines going on around there, around there. Like for instance. About the mark of the beast right now. They're going to put a little chip in their head. That has nothing to do with the mark that is described in the Tanakh. That is not true. Will that probably happen to the majority of the world? Yes, but that is not the mark of the beast. It is not. The mark is already described to you in the Old Testament. The New Testament is an extension of all the prophecies and the word that Yahweh spoke through Moses. It's already there. Read your Bible. Study the Hebrew. 
having the name removed from people also marked them, didn't it? The man with no name. Erased from the book that Yahweh has in the heavens. In order for us to have that mark and be uh, looking forward to that time to be known by Him, we must go through the process that this prophecy is speaking about. Now, so, it means to thrust concretely trumpet the peg or the fastening of that peg is going to be connected to a trumpet call. <laughs> Wait a minute. So in the Feast of Trumpets, isn't that when Yahshua is returning? They sound the trumpet. He's, he's going to come back, atone the earth of its sin. And then He's going to tabernacle among us just like He did when He came the first time. It was during tabernacles. So this faceting of this peg is going to happen at a specific time that is already marked. Yahweh's got it up there in His calendar in the kingdom. Right? On this day, this is going to happen. And it's all going to have to do with church hear that they're going to freak out. They're not going to know what to do. As a Pentecostal, I was going to wait for JC to come back so we could roll around out in the parking lot together. <laughs> Speaking in some gibberish. I don't say that to be offensive to those who may, may believe in that. But the heavenly listen, the heavenly tongue is that right there. That's what was breathed. That's the language that was breathed from the heavens. It's Hebrew. So, Yahweh that breathed the Hebrew language will always be my Hebrew. Do you understand? He is the one who has breathed this into His creation. Much of the creation is seeing and hearing in Greek dialect. They don't know about this fastening, something being removed and something fastened, and him slapping his hands together to get your attention. And I would submit to you that this also is alluding that Yahshua was a beckoning whistle at his first coming. He was the beckoning whistle. But when that trumpet sounds again, this world is not going to know what hit him. This language is so important. You see what we just extracted out of the book of Isaiah? From one small little question that may have arised in this sister's mind while she was just laying in bed one evening studying the Word? Thrust, to thrust a pole into the ground, such as when setting up the tent. Also, the thrust, the sound of the trumpet by blowing. Yahshua was nailed to a pole. He was fastened. He is the peg. The tent peg that holds down the tent and the original tent floor plan. Okay? Let's go back and look at the history of the letter there. The wall. Now remember, 
myself and Benner, and I believe Brad Scott as well, believe that the wa is the more proper pronunciation anciently. It says the original pictograph used in the early Semitic script is a, and there you see it. And then over here, you guys can see the middle form of it. And there's other different forms depending on what part of the world you're chasing down these Hebrew descendants. But one thing remained the same is the meaning of that. So it's the picture is a picture of a tent peg. The tent pegs were made of wood. Yahshua was a branch, wasn't he? He was a branch of Jesse, wasn't he? And may have been Y-shaped to prevent the rope from slipping off. The modern Hebrew name for this letter is Vav, a word meaning peg or hook. This letter is used in modern Hebrew as a consonant with a V sound as a vowel. If the modern Hebrew letter appears as that form, it is the vowel sound A. Oh. And if it appears as that form, it is the vowel sound U. Oh. When used as a vowel, the ancient pronunciation was in A. Oh or an uh. In each of the consonant, consonant vowel letters of the, he, of the ancient Hebrew language, the pronunciation of the consonant is closely related to the pronunciation of the vowel, such as the letter hey that was pictured above there. Look here. As the pictograph indicates, this letter represents a peg or a hook, which are used for securing something. The meaning of this letter is to add or secure. Again, making perfect sense to what we're seeing in our English Bibles. Everybody? <laughs> See what I mean? He's got our attention. We're looking at these ancient meanings and it's beginning to make sense. Everything that we thought we knew about the Bible, especially the Holy Bible, is now beginning to come into question. Is it not? Now, I want to make sure that I'm not pointing fingers at the heart or the intent of anybody in the room or anybody that will watch this. Because the intent of the heart of many people is to serve Him. But it is in the heart and in the mind and the goal of the enemy is to divert your heart's desire to Him. No matter what the cost. By what deception. The fact of the matter is, was the name of the Savior J.C.? Was He ever called J.C. one time on this planet? No. No come out of that falsehood. Serve Yahweh's redemption. Yahshua. This is very important. What I was saying earlier is something about the law being silent at some times is because of this type of information here. This letter is frequently used as a prefix to words to mean and in the sense of adding things together. You see that? So anciently, this word, now, now when you see the wall as a prefix, it means and, like he and she, right? Then you'll see the wall as a prefix there, meaning he's going to connect those two, he and she. Yah and Yasha, connecting them. Does it change the pronunciation of one of the words? Yes. But as a connecting letter, is it supposed to be pronounced? 
That is my argument. Anciently, many times the wall would have been silent because it was just doing its job. It was fastening two things together. Just like Yahshua does. He's fastening us to himself. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's a big amen. Oh, amen. Excuse me. Praise Yah. So look down here. Uh, finish reading this. The early Semitic wall evolved into, uh, there's, you, you'll see the middle form. This letter then became, and there you see the modern Aramaic form of that letter, of the late Semitic script and evolved into the modern Vav. The middle Semitic letter was adopted by the Greeks and the Romans to be the letter F, but was dropped from the Greek alphabet later. What does that tell you? That the Greek you see today has changed as well. You have Koin Greek, which means common Greek. So common Greek today may have not been the common Greek of the times of Yahshua. Matter of fact, history shows that the Greek language didn't have capital letters either in the beginning. Now they do. The late Semitic form of the letter became the number nine. So, there's a little bit of history on it. So, yes, absolutely, this is a picture of Yahshua, but at the same time, it's uh, in this specific prophecy, something that was is being removed, and Yahweh is fastening a peg that cannot be moved. And it would do what? Mark us? Bring us in the covenant? And give us the knowledge that we needed at a specific given time. How we've missed that all these years, just don't know. Now, So, long way around it. Yes, sister. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, uh, because you had written here, through Yahshua Messiah, we are fastened on a, stead, on a steadfast place. So, yes, at that time, we will be fastened to a steadfast place. And that's where He's taking us. Out of this, He's secured us right now. He's provided security. But He's going to add us to Himself when we get into the kingdom with Him. We become one with Him. He's adding us to Him. Like when a man and a woman come together, they are one. That's what the fastening is all about. That we see only one, we worship only one, and we become one with Him. Not when one with them. We've been going over this uh, trinity and, and uh, tritheism, polytheism, dualism. Think about it for a moment. Is Yahweh not able to say, I declare this and I will do that? Does He have to say, hey, which one of you guys want to help me over here? That person needs a healing. I got it. No, I'll do it. No, hey, I'll do this one. No, you did the last one. Who's going to get the glory of it all? I have room in my heart to worship only one. My heart belongs to Him. He redeemed me. Now, so we had a question about Colossians chapter 2. Somebody uh, sent me a message and said, Colossians 2 is a very difficult passage. How do we explain it? We don't explain it. We look at it correctly. It'll explain itself. <laughs> so let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 2.
they had brought up verse 14. It says, having blotted out the certificate of debt. Now, R says certificate of debt. So the scriptures have done a very good job at correcting that. What most English versions say is, excuse me, having blotted out the handwriting of requirement that was against us. And what the church has done is told everybody that this is what is written, the commandments that are written in the Old Testament. Those are the things that was against us. That is uh, the handwriting of requirements is all of that legalism back there in the Old Testament. When you look up that word handwriting, the handwriting of requirements goes back to one Greek word that's about that long, I can't pronounce it. You look up the definition and it means certificate of debt. That changes everything. The Greek word that they translated, translated handwriting of requirement there actually means certificate of debt that was against us. You see, that means that we as a people, as a nation, as Israelites, there was a debt to be paid for what we did to Him. And so Yahweh had recorded in the heavens, He raised an oath, raised His hand in an oath, even against the Levites. He raised His hand in His oath against them because of their continued idolatry and adultery. Adultery. So there was something being kept in the heavens and recorded against us. Properly translated, that says, having blotted out the certificate of debt that was against us by the dogmas which stood against us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the stake. Okay, so if you're uh, looking at a holy Bible, this, po this poses a problem because it says handwriting of requirements. And anybody that, that is indoctrinated with the church doctrine is immediately going to go see all of that stuff back there, the feasts, that Sabbath, and all of that stuff is what it's speaking about here. No, it's not. It's talking about the death penalty for committing adultery against the king who was to be your husband. So let's back up a little bit and grab some context. This one isn't too hard to explain. <laughs> Beginning in verse 1. For I wish you to know what a great struggle I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, in order that their hearts might be encouraged, being knit together in love, and to all riches of the entire confirmation of understanding to a true knowledge of the secret of Elohim and of the Father and of the Anointed One, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I say, and this I say, so that no one deceives you with enticing words. Do you see what he just said? He said that all of the secret things that he's about to reveal is hidden in all the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge that was spoken by Yahweh. Where is that recorded for you at? In the Old Testament. So by the time you get over there to verse 14, it can't be condemning what was written in the Old Testament. To a true 
knowledge. And, and now remember, in, in Greek and Latin lifestyle, Gnosticism was extant in those days. Okay, so that means Gnostic uh, type uh, teachings were very, very uh, credible by most people that were out there in these Greek nations. And so what he was saying here, I'm going to show you the true knowledge. It's been hidden in secret from you. And he began to minister the word of Elohim to them. Verse 3 again, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say so that no one deceives you with what enticing words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your belief in the Anointed One. Therefore, as you accepted Messiah, Yahshua the Master, walk in Him, having been rooted and built up in Him and established in the belief as you were taught, overflowing in it with thanksgiving. See that no one makes a prey of you, no one deceives you, through what? Philosophy and vain deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary matters of the world, and not according to Messiah. Because in Him dwells all the completeness of the mightiness bodily. Now many of your versions, like the King James, say, uh, because in Him dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That debunks Trinity right there. All the fullness of the Godhead or the mightiness of Yahweh dwelt in one body. Not three different people dwelling in one body. According to their own doctrine and the, and the book they read out of, that cannot be possible. All the fullness of of the mightiness of Yahweh was in the body of Messiah. And you have been made complete in Him. See that? Him. All the mightiness of the Spirit of Yahweh was in the body of Messiah. Made complete in Him who is the head of all principality and authority. In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision not made with hands in the putting off of the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Messiah. Having been buried with Him in, there's your baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through the belief in the working of Elohim who raised Him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven, forgiven you all trespass, having blotted out the certificate of debt that was against you in the Shemaiah. Now it makes sense, doesn't it? By the darkness which stood against us, the Torah of Yahweh was never against us. Paul turns around and says, you know what? Had it not been for the Torah, I wouldn't know what to repent from. I wouldn't know what would covetous. I wouldn't know what adultery was. Had not the Torah, the law of Yahweh, spoke to me and got my attention, I would have never known what I was supposed to repent from. Therefore, the law is just and holy and good. Romans chapter 7. It justifies. He said it is just. And it is tob in Hebrew. Tob. I mean, is it tobet? Can you look that up for me real quick? I think it's tobet. It's a mark for the house. on in 
until we find the, the number there. So that's what was nailed to the stake. What was nailed to the stake was our certificate of debt that we owed him. We had sinned against him. We had trespassed against him. And that's what was nailed to the stake. Not the law, but actually... Remember they crucified people and they nailed them to the pole, but then they nailed their charges over them, didn't they? Right? Well, guess what? We were supposed to be that one that was nailed to the stake. So what Yahweh did is He took the Torah, the Word, as it was manifested in the flesh, and He nailed it to the stake. And He said, You broke My law. That's your charges. There it is. He nailed it to the stake. And then the charges that the people brought up against Him and His redemption were nailed above that. So yes, the Torah, the law was nailed to the stake, but did it remain there? Nope. Matter of fact, they took it off the stake and they robed it. They wrapped it up and they placed it back in the earth. And several days later, it was alive and it ministered to the people. The law lives on. The Torah lives. It was never what was known in the stake. And I would submit to anybody teaching that out there, take your Savior off the stake. Leave Him alone. Let Him do His work in you. Let the work of the Torah of Yah bring you to your fullness in your servitude in Messiah. Picking up at verse 16, Let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of what is to come. Some of you are saying in the body of Messiah, but the Scripture says, but the body of Messiah. Now, it says, Therefore let no one judge you in eating or drinking or respect of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So, many teachers say, see, the, yeah, the new moon, well, first of all, let's go ahead and cover that. Yahweh never said, Yahweh never said that the new moon was a Sabbath. It wasn't never a festival. You go back into the book of Leviticus and you read about the feasts, he never said to do anything when the new moon come around. When you see it talking about in the book of Psalms, I believe it's chapter 81, I, I, I could be wrong there, but in, I, in, in the book of Psalms it talks about sounding the shofar on the new moon and various other places. It's talking about the day of trumpets when you see the new moon, that's when you sound the trumpet. And that day is a Sabbath. Yahweh never in his, in Leviticus 23, he said, these are my appointed times. Did he not? Is the new moon ever brought up in there at all as a Sabbath? No. <laughs> no, he did not. So people who are saying we're supposed to gather every month at the new moon, sound the shofar, and it's a Sabbath, you are adding commandments to Yahweh's appointed times. Yahweh never said, this is my appointed time. When you see the new moon, He never said that. Not once. That is actually direct disobedience because you're telling people that Yahweh has a feast that was never ordained by Him. However, when we see the new moon in the seventh month, we are, that is a Sabbath. Yahshua spoke of this. Do not let this day come upon you like a thief in the night. Be ready in and out of season. Hallelujah. We can't add a feast in there. Then there would be eight feasts outside of the seventh day Sabbath. 
Yahweh never said that was one of His appointed times. If you're a teacher out there and you're teaching that the new moon is an appointed time by Yahweh, that is false. You need to repent. He did not say that. He did not declare that was an appointed time. You are. And so you're just as guilty as these people because what they were saying was, don't let anybody judge you for doing what Yahweh said to do. There was people in that land that had repented and they used to follow the festivals and the ways of that land. And what Shaul was saying, don't let them judge you. Don't let them judge you for doing the commands of Yahweh. which are a shadow of what is to come, but the body of Messiah. And at first, the first line in verse 18 explains specifically what I was just talking about. Let no one deprive you of the prize. One who takes delight in false humility and worship of messengers. Taking his stand on what he has not seen, puffed up by his fleshly mind. Mm -mm -mm. and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the growth of Elohim. If then you die with Messiah from the elementary matters of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Then must I go on? Why aren't all the assemblies got the doors open right now? Huh? Explain that. Why are you going back to the weak and bitterly elementary matters of the world and being ruled by the ways of the world instead of by the name of Yah? This was a time for Yahweh to ruffle up some feathers. If all of the assemblies would have had people come and pray and repent and lift up His name, you know what? It was a time that He could have glorified Himself. What do you do? You close the doors. Misrepresenting our king, that is not an ambassador. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which are all to perish with use according to the commands and teachings. Me, not Yahweh. He was directly telling them, don't go back into those old, don't go back to Christmas. Don't go back to Easter. Don't go back to New Year's. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell them, son. Speak it, Malachi. Don't go back to those things. Don't let anybody judge you for keeping the Sabbath, dressing holy. Huh? Not being scared of what men can do to you instead of what Yahweh can do to you. Now, before we close, I had a question out of Roman, uh, Romans 10. Romans 10, 9. How do you explain that one? Oh, yeah. Romans chapter 10. Again, this one won't even take a word study. Uh, they wanted me to explain Romans 10, 9 and ask what about Romans 13. I was also, uh, this is one of those chapters that came up in the conversation I had with the authorities. So that's one that I definitely want to look at before we close. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Master Yahshua and believe in your heart that Elohim has raised Him from the dead, you are saved. No. 
You know what it says? That's what they teach you it means. That if you confess with your mouth the Master Yahshua and believe in your heart that Elohim has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's Greek number 4982. Have a look at that when you have some spare time. If we back up, what we've done is, is many people, many pastors have taken Romans 10.9 and John 3.16 and they made a prayer out of it. Neither one of those passages have anything to do with deliverance or going into the kingdom. Matter of fact, if you back up to uh, Romans 10, beginning in verse 1, chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, it explains uh, verse 9 very clearly. And if you actually, if you read into verse 10, it clarifies itself. Pulling things out of context can be dangerous to the flock. Verse 1 in chapter 10 says, Truly, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to Elohim for all mankind is for deliverance. See my point? He says specifically, Truly, brothers, my heart's desire... He's talking to people in the body of Messiah. He calls them brothers. My heart's desire and prayer to Elohim for Israel is that they be saved. For I bear them witness that they have an ardor for Elohim, but not according to what? Knowledge. What knowledge is that? The same knowledge that we've seen in our word study of the uh, word Takah. To know that peg that has been fastened. The story remains the same. For not knowing the righteousness of Elohim and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to righteousness to the righteousness of Elohim. For Messiah is the goal. Many of you are seeing end of the law to all those who believe. You look at that word end in the Greek and it means goal or a point aimed at. For Messiah is the goal, the point aimed at of the Torah unto righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moshe writes about the righteousness which is of the Torah, the man who does these shall what? Live by them. See that? Shaul is connecting the teachings of Messiah to the teachings of Moshe. In verse 8, but what does it say? Speaking about Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11, I believe it is. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of belief which we are proclaiming. Then if you confess with your mouth, he's telling the Israelites, you must accept your Redeemer. That if you confess with your mouth the Master Yahshua and believe in your heart that Elohim has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Look at verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is delivered. Rescued. Because the scripture says, whoever puts his trust in him, shall not be put to shame. Look at verse 13. <laughs> Remember we were talking about that mark just a while ago. It was the Sabbath and the name. Look at this. Verse 13 and verse 14. For everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him whom they have not believed? Mm hmm. And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without someone proclaiming it? Mm. 
So there we see, again, if you go back <clears throat> to the beginning of the chapter there, it's really not talking about all mankind being saved. It was talk, he was talking about his brethren according to the flesh who are Israelites. They've got to confess. He says that's the reason why you can't be redeemed because you will not confess that Yahshua is the Messiah. Romans chapter 13. Conversation with the authority. I believe the conversation was something along the line of that he had spoke to somebody locally and they said, hey, you should share this verse with him like I didn't know it. I'm not saying that out of pride or haughtiness. I'm just saying um, all of these ones that Christian Jews to throw at people who are obedient to the Torah, I've had them thrown at me many times a piece. Each one of them comes often. Okay? Verse 1, Let every being be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from Elohim. And the authorities that exist are appointed by Elohim. Okay, first century. First century. He's writing this letter to a group of people in Ephesus. And we already know, if you read the book of Ephesians, come, you know, cover to cover, chapter to chapter, word, word for word, that he stressed obedience to those people to the word of Yahweh first. First and foremost, you must be obedient to the word of Yahweh. Now, <clears throat> There are governing rules in every nation in which we've been driven to. Let every being be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from Elohim, and the authorities that exist are appointed by Elohim. So he who opposes the authority withstands the institution of Elohim, and those who withstand shall bring judgment on themselves. So, let's continue reading. For those ruling are an object of fear, not to good works, but to evil. See, the only part that was quoted to me was the first two verses. But I'm knowing the rest of the chapter. Because the ones who have been put in authority are unto the works of evil. So there is a line there. If the governing authority is telling you to do something that is totally contrary to the word of Elohim, don't do it. It's evil. Yahweh never told us it's okay to perform evil acts in the nations. As a matter of fact, He said, repent. Repent in the nations and call upon me. Now, what is evil and wickedness? Someone who is dysfunctional. That is not following the original pattern of Elohim. That's a wide perspective, everyone. Verse 3 again. For those ruling are an object of fear, not to good works, but to evil. Do you wish to be not afraid of the authority. Do the good, and you shall have praise from it. For it is, a, it is a servant of Elohim to you for good. But if you do evil, wait a minute. What is evil? The opposite of righteous. Okay? But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword in vain. For it is a servant of Elohim, a revenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now there's two things that we can look at here. 
He could be talking about the authorities and the rulers within the synagogues or the congregations. Okay? Opposed to the authorities and the rulers of that land. But he very specifically says, don't do the evil. And evil and wickedness is the op opposite of what Yahweh says is righteousness. And, the, and, and very clearly, we see this same picture whenever the Pharisees commanded the apostles not to teach anymore in the name of Yahshua. Don't you go out there with this doctrine anymore. You need to stop it. And they said, shall we rather listen to men or Elohim? Explain that one to me. I know what this means. My job, no matter where I'm at, in any evil, wicked nation, is to first and foremost serve Elohim without fear and trembling. Don't fear what man can do to you that can destroy your physical body, but fear what Elohim can do to you by destroying, destroying your soul. We don't have to be scared of Him, but fear Him in reverence. <laughs> Again, 4, it says, But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword in vain, for it is a, for it is a servant of Elohim, a revenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to the to be subject not only because of the wrath, but also because of the conscience. See, our conscience it should be uh, meditating on what Yahweh says is wrong and keeping that corrected rather than what's going on around us in the world. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are servants of Elohim, attending continually to these duties. Render therefore to all what is due to, to them. Tax to whom taxes do, toll to whom toll, fear to whom fear, respect to whom respect. Notice it never once says anywhere in there that you are eligible to break the Torah in order to pay your taxes. You can pay your taxes and respect people in the world and governing authorities without breaking the commandments of Elohim. But that's not good enough for the authorities in the world, is it? They want us to live in the same wickedness that they're in. Even if they're good people. Verse 8. Oh, no one any matter except to love one another for he who loves another has filled. So there's that, there's that filling up of your purpose in Torah. And love in Hebrew, what does it mean? What is the, what is the, what is the uh, function of loving someone? Provide, protect, and cover. To provide for, protect, and cover something. That is love from a Hebrew perspective. Yahweh so loved the world that He gave His only begotten, that He gave something that would cover and feed and nurture us. Hallelujah. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there be any other command, it is summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil. Notice that he separates the marriage covenant commandments from the, from the governing authorities that are telling you to pay taxes and everything. Very clearly, if you read the whole chapter, it is not meant to execute believers with. Saying you must be in unison, in unity with the world governing authorities. It is not saying that very clearly. So, before we sign off, any questions or comments at all?
Anyone? Everybody must be hungry. <laughs> I have to let it settle down for a while. Right. We'll leave everything going then. We'll leave everything up here because I know once we sit down to fellowship, table fellowship, by the way, Father, in the name of Yahshua, we praise you and we thank you for this day. And we thank you for another day in your Moedim. As we begin to table fellowship, we ask that you would bless the meal. We thank you for providing it. We pray blessings upon all the body of Messiah everywhere, Father. We pray for all those who are in need, that you will meet the needs of your people. Father, we also pray that you will allow us to be vessels of honor, that you will use us to draw others to your light, to your truth, through your good news, through the redemption that you have provided. In the mighty name of Yahshua, we pray and ask this, and also we ask that you would just uh, bless the hands that has prepared the meal before us. In the mighty name of Yahshua, hallelujah. Amen. Oh,